do you like your tabletop RPGs to be grim, gritty and grounded? If so, then Legend of the Bones is the podcast for you. A mix of old school solo D&D and dark fantasy storytelling. In Legend of the Bones, the dice rule. There are no re-rolls, no fudging the dice, no meta currency. The roll of the bones will determine the character's destiny and no one will be spared their fate. None shall escape the destiny of bone. Coming to your favourite podcatcher in May 2022. The following podcast is intended for a mature audience. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to Tale of the Manticore. Like the creature from which it takes its name, Tale of the Manticore is a mashup, a crossbreeding between two different species of storytelling. Here you will find the unpredictability of old school paper and dice games with the storycraft of a dark fantasy novel. No character is sacred and no character will be spared if the dice decide their fate is at hand. The dice determine all. According to lore, the tale of a manticore is barbed with cruel iron spikes. There will be much pain in the days ahead. Last time on Tale of the Manticore. In the previous episode, we see Harl level up just before the party goes to battle with a spectator, which is an extra planar creature out of the pages of the Monster Manual 2. Due to some very fortunate dice rolling early on in the combat, the PCs trounce this foe in a battle that might easily have gone very differently. After leaving the prison area, the companions explore a number of mundane rooms, mostly empty and abandoned since the evacuation of the Agrigen many centuries before. Eventually, they come to a gigantic cavern overgrown with luminous mushrooms. There's a second waterfall here powering yet another water wheel. All this is quite a sight to behold, and they marvel as they cross to the other side and take an exit that leads to a new section of the Dwarven Hold. This level seems to favor form over function and is much more than a simple collection of utility rooms like the ones they had recently passed through. This is where the guildsmen and artisans plied their trades, and the artistry of the design shows it. But the episode ends in despair when the party discovers that the only path leading to the surface is completely blocked by fallen rubble. The way things are going, it looks like the only way forward will be to go all the way back. And even that might not be possible. Between the Lines you might remember that at the end of chapter 71, Umora suggested they stop to rest in the Mushroom Cavern. The party is far from being at full strength, and if they can manage to find a way to reach the top of the Egogen alive, which is certainly a big problem that still needs to be worked out, it would be best if they could be rested when they get there. This is what Harl said in reply. I am loath to delay any longer than is necessary. If we tarry, the worm may decide to find another city to destroy. I don't want that kind of blood on my hands. The burning of Sechoros presented an additional complication in their quest. Time matters. The dragon, Harl is sure, is baiting them and demonstrating the consequences of inaction. Sechoros will not be the last town to burn if swift action is not taken. Well, Harl is right to think so. Nera Numenax is doing exactly this. She attacked Thangar almost immediately after being summoned and finding no challenger to fight. That was on day 71. Sixteen days later, on day 87, she annihilated Sechoros. What place would be next? It's a toss-up between Wilmington and New Lethwin. Those are the two nearest communities. There's a 50-50 chance that she would fly north or south from Thangar, for she will certainly go there first to make sure the dwarves have not started rebuilding. So, how quickly is this countdown clock ticking? Given what's happened before, I'll rule that the dragon will leave the Agrigen and choose a new target approximately every two weeks. Once the two-week mark is reached, I'll roll a high-low on a d20 each day until I get a high result. 
I will mean she goes on that same day to destroy someplace new. Currently, it's day 99. On day 101, I'll start making these daily checks. If the PCs cannot find a way to reach the dragon soon, hundreds more people could die. Whether the blood really is on Harl's hands, well, I'll leave that up to you to decide. Chapter 72, Part 1, Day 99, Late Afternoon. Party Status, Harl, 30 of 39 hit points. Gyrios, 29 of 37. Eridin, 14 of 20. Umura, 17 of 25. Daz, 13 of 17. Spells Available. Umura has memorized Hold Portal, Shield, Levitate, and Water Breathing. Kyrios has prayed for Bless, Resist Fire, and Striking. They each kept their own company as they backtracked, either struggling with despair or madly trying to think up a solution. They had no idea how to address the immediate problem of the trapped room, but they knew that there was no purpose to staying where they were. The rubble blocking the stairs was not going anywhere. It was too big to clear, and there was no way around it. They had spent an hour making sure that Harl's memory of the maps was correct, just in case, but they only succeeded in confirming what they already knew. The staircase was the only way to the surface. They would just have to find another solution. They stopped to rest briefly in the Mushroom Farm Cavern. Even though they had just seen it, the sight of the place took their breath away once again. Mushrooms, both giant and miniature, jumbled together. Some of the fungi even had others growing right on their stems and caps. Perhaps it was the soothing glow of the bioluminescence in gentle greens, blues, yellows, and pinks, but this is where they finally came up with the first potential solution to their most immediate problem, which was how to bypass the room with the trapped floor without knowing the password. What if we call out passwords from the door standing outside? Suggested Gyrios, hopefully. We can try, but I doubt it will be as easy as that, Harl replied, shaking his head and looking defeated. Silence followed as they racked their brains. Umora looked up at the huge waterfall and the turning water wheel behind it. I wonder, she began. Harl looked up with the barest glint of hope in his eye. Umora often had bright solutions to hard problems. I wonder, if I were to levitate up through the opening where the water drops. You once said that the Fire River enters the mountain at the mushroom fields, so that might allow me to get outside. Are you planning on holding your breath? asked Harl. He was already studying his feet again, the Ember of Hope having winked out. I can manage that part, said Umora, thinking of her new spell as yet unused. But despite the confidence in her voice, she knew her plan could not work. The force of the falling water would be far too powerful for her levitate spell, whether she could breathe or not. Furthermore, they only had a 50-foot rope and the opening in the ceiling was a couple hundred feet above their heads. Harl had been sitting with his back against a cream-colored mushroom. He got up. I'll try to solve the password problem. Alone. You all might as well stay here and get some rest. Maybe someone will come up with a plan that could work. No offense, Umura. With that, the dwarf walked off in the direction of the S-shaped tunnel with the trapped room at the far end. He returned after an hour to find his companions sitting or lying on their backs. He reported his failure in a stony voice and sat down among them. The thing would not even speak to me this time. I think it will only activate for non-dwarves, and that's why it spoke to us in the common tongue. I had thought that maybe with the rope we could find a way to cross the room, with the dwarf holding on to each side, but it just wouldn't work because... Well, I'm sure you've all thought of that already anyway. Umura was lying on her back and looking straight up. It's almost like looking at the night sky, the way the crystals reflect the mushrooms glow, like a nebula. A what? Gyrios had never heard the word. A nebula. Stardust, basically. Oh, yes. It does resemble a clear night sky. Except for where that, uh, whatever it is, breaks the illusion. He pointed to a spot in the center of the cavern's ceiling where a vent, much like the one they had seen in the forge, had been installed. Umura frowned in thought. Harl, 
How much do you know about these events? A little. Well, actually, quite a bit. I learned about them in the final year of my formal education. What do you want to know? He was sitting up straight now, thinking she might be onto something. Well, I presume it leads to the surface. What if I were to levitate up there and see if it can get us outside? We still have the problem of our rope being too short. There were piles of chains in the forge, offered Daz, joining the discussion. If you and I can bypass the trapped room, if it isn't triggered for us, we could pitch some and bring it here. Perhaps, muttered Harl. But the vents will not simply be open tunnels. They'll be barred to prevent unwanted creatures from entering, especially here where they grow the food, but probably everywhere. But it's possible that it isn't barred, or that the bars are rusted and weak, or that there's a gate that can be opened and closed, right? Not likely, Humora. Not likely, fine, but possible, right? Isn't it possible? Harl shrugged. I suppose it is. I can't see why they'd put a gate in the vent. It's not like they were moving through them, but yes, it's possible. Umura stood up and concentrated until she began to float in the air. As she lifted higher and higher, she pulled the hood off her lantern, making her look like a fallen star trying to rejoin the heavens. When she reached the top, she had to guide herself across the ceiling with her hands until she reached the vent. Then she disappeared up and inside it. Kyrios had not been worried for her when she was floating in midair, but now that she was out of sight, he felt a pang of concern. It was awfully brave what she was doing. A few moments later, just long enough for his worry to kindle into mild panic, Umura's light dipped out from the vent's aperture, and then the sorceress was back in view, descending slowly, like a heavy weight dropped from a height and coming straight down, but in slow motion. When she reached the bottom, the others looked at her hopefully, but she had to disappoint them. Shaking her head, she said, It's as you said, Harl. There are thick bars set into an iron ring that fills the tube. It's mortared right into the wall, and there's no gate. The bars are rusted, but each one is an inch thick. It would take the strength of a giant to budge that thing. I might have an idea. It was Daz talking. He stole a glance at the waterfall and the water wheel, and then looked back at the others. Do you remember if there were any hooks down in the forge? Harl's eyes flicked open wide as he realized what Daz had in mind. Daz, this idea, it could work. He looked at the waterfall and back at Daz, then repeated, It could really work. In the oceanic realm of Manon, seven kings. Some with grace, others with tyranny. It seems the gods have turned their backs, leaving mortals to deal with all the evils. Playing Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, enjoy a completely original and new homebrew world, where our players find themselves traversing an archipelago divided by desires of gods, devils, kings, and queens. Join the chaos by subscribing to our YouTube channel, Chaotic Cast TV, and by following us on Instagram, at Chaotic Cast TV, for the latest news and updates. Welcome to the chaos. Hey D&D fans, we are d and Disaster, an actual play Dungeons & Dragons podcast starring our disorganised yet lovable party throughout the homebrew world of Canaspa. We're kind of like opposite Scooby-Doo, we only make problems and it was us all along. If you like questionable comedy... <laughs> I hope that the rat did a thumbs up. <laughs> yes! Holy shit, that's got some possible thumbs! <laughs> Edgy drama... And this bolt of electricity flies through a line, hitting all four of Oh, we're in oh, the line! No! We're in the line! An unhinged disaster. Unusually quiet, just like... Charles, please. <laughs> <laughs> then we are the podcast for you. Join us wherever you get your podcasts by searching D and Disaster. That's with an ampersand. And be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Our handles are at D and Disaster. We hope to see you there. But until then, be disastrous. Chapter 72, Part 2, Day 99, Evening Party Status The party status is unchanged, with the exception of Umura, who has used her spell of Levitate. 
It took three trips for Harl and Daz to collect as much chain as they would need. On their first return to the forge, the Magic Mouth had not demanded a password, and so it was agreed that the dwarves would make all subsequent trips alone. They didn't want to risk bringing a human along, who might trigger the trapped floor again. Umura hadn't forgotten the fire elemental and certainly didn't mind staying away, though she did privately warn Harl about it and suggest he kept his distance. Presently, the two dwarves were returning from their third and final trip to the forge. Sorry, that took a little longer than we'd expected. Harl was referring to a conversation that had occurred earlier. In it, he had explained how they had been unable to find enough of the pieces they would need and would have to make some with the smithing tools available there. The dwarves began to unshoulder their burdens. Each had a great loop of chain over their shoulder and crossing their chest like a bandolier. Oh, that's better. I swear someone was adding steps to that staircase between climbs. Uh, my back is in knots, complained Daz as he laid down on the cavern floor and stretched. Harl, do you know what time of day it is outside? Asked Gyrios. Same time it is in here, replied the dwarf. No, I, I mean... I'm just pulling your leg, Gyrios. I know how it is with you humans and being underground. It's evening. In fact, it's probably a good time for a meal. They all came together to sit in a circle and share preserved rations from Gyrios' pack. And as they slowly chewed their small portions, they carefully went over the plan once again. Harl took a pull at a water skin and handed it to Umura. Will you be ready after we finish our supper? Unfortunately, no. I'll need a full night's rest before I can cast that spell again. Oh, said Harl, looking a bit crestfallen. Well, I suppose there's no help for that, is there? I'm afraid not, Umura replied. We'll simply have to wait until tomorrow. The companions spend the rest of the evening talking until natural fatigue tells them it's time to go to sleep. They post individual watches, with Haro going first, then Eridin. Next is Umura, followed by Daz, and lastly, while Dawn is casting pink hues over the Kazmirioth outside, Gyrios. Nothing disturbs them during the night, and in fact their watches are quite enjoyable, given their gorgeous surroundings. The only exception is Harl, who is once again plagued by bad dreams. By now his companions are used to seeing him toss and turn, and to hearing his moans. They feel only sympathy, for he's been tortured this way every night for weeks. When Gyrios completes his prayers, he trades out some of his memorized spells for different ones. He chooses. Cure light wounds, times two. Resist fire. Bless. Striking. And cure serious wounds. Although the full night's sleep will restore one hit point to each of the companions, it only makes sense for the cleric to do some additional healing as soon as the others awaken, and so he does, using one Cure Light Wounds on each Harl and Eridine. He saves the Cure Serious Wounds spell for later use. Harl receives six points. Great roll. That takes him from 31 to 37 hit points. Eridine receives uh, two points. Her new hit point score is 17. Well, every little bit helps, I suppose. Umura also changes up her spell roster. She replaces her spent levitation spell, swaps out hold portal for light, and water breathing for a second lightning bolt. If their plan works, there will be a terrible fight in the near future, and they'll need the firepower. When his prayers were complete, Gyrios roused his companions and administered some healing to Harl and Eridine. After, they all broke their fast together with a simple meal of salted meat, hard cheese, and dry biscuits. They also drank what was left of the water and refilled the skins by holding them under the cataract. Harl then loaded up Umura with about 40 pounds of chain and asked, How long will the spell last? A good two hours, replied the sorceress. Harl nodded, satisfied. Good. That should be more than enough. Make sure to secure the hooks as tightly as you can. Of course, Harl. I'll be right back. With that, Umura recast her spell and floated slowly back up to the ventilation shaft before disappearing inside. Within the stone tube, there was a sound like moaning wind, but it sounded strange and hollow. When she reached the bars, she carefully secured the chains and hooks, 
all 12 of them, as well as she could, by weaving them through the bars and distributing the better part of them to the other ones. Reason told her that this would give their plan the best chance for success. When the work was complete, she exited the tube and levitated back down to the cavern floor, steadily unspooling the chains as she went. When she reached the floor, she found that, as they had hoped, there was an extra hundred feet of slack for each length. A large ring, also forged by Harl, connected each one to the other by the ends. It was also attached to a huge iron hook Harl had found amongst the other metalwork supplies. Had it been straightened out, this hook would have been a good 18 inches long, and it was thicker than her wrist. She hoped it would hold. I hope this works, said Harl to himself, giving voice to Umora's thoughts. He took the heavy hook from the sorceress's hands and said, All right, everyone, this is it. Best you stand well back. Harl waited for the others to move well away before he lobbed the iron hook, trailing a dozen chains, into the teeth of the great stone water wheel. <clears throat> the first three attempts failed, but on the fourth throw, the hook caught hold. <clears throat> Harl guided the chains as they ran through his hands to keep them from tangling as long as he dared. But shortly it became unsafe to remain where he was. As the last of the slack was taken up, wrapped around the big stone wheel, Harl dropped the chain and sprinted away as fast as he could manage. The chain pulled taut, making a slanting iron line from water wheel to ceiling before, inevitably, there was a deafening, rending sound from the ventilation shaft and the fitted iron ring. Masonry still clinging to its edges came hurtling to the cavern floor. It smashed against the rocks with another ear-splitting boom, causing bits of stone and mushroom to go flying in all directions. A cloud of dust and spores burst into the air, just as the ring bounced and jagged madly to one side. Within seconds, the water wheel took up the new slack and the ring was drawn into the falling water by its chains, where it hugged the wheel's flanges and rotated along with it. The companions had thrown themselves to the ground when the ring had crashed to the floor, and now they shakily picked themselves up, breathing in the dust and spores, and coughing. <coughs> by and by, the air cleared. Harl had choked until tears sprang from his eyes. All the same, he was smiling by the time the others could see him. Success! He exclaimed, walking towards Umura with something held in each hand. Here, be sure to pound it all the way in. Umura took the proffered hammer and large iron spike. Standing under the ventilation shaft once again, she picked up a second chain that Harl had prepared earlier. This one had a ring attached to the links every three feet. The fabrication of this item is what had taken the dwarf so long the previous night when they had visited the forge a third time. It had not been quick to make, but it was necessary for the final part of the plan. Umura lifted into the air as she had before, and entered the shaft above, unshouldering loops of chain and letting its full length hang beneath her as she went. When she reached the top, a two hundred foot chain dangled between her feet. Then from below, the other third soft tapping sounds, followed by slower, stronger hammer strikes. Moments after the noise abated, Umura's lantern flashed in the mouth of the tube. This was the signal to begin climbing. Eridine, who was the best climber, held onto the tail of the chain as, one by one, each of the companions made the slow and harrowing climb to the top, moving from ring to ring. Finally, the light rogue pulled herself up after them, with the chain swishing behind her like a fish tail. Then, she too wriggled into the stone pipe of the ventilation shaft and was gone. Leadership. The final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starfleet Leadership Academy. It's ongoing mission to develop leaders through Star Trek. To boldly go where no podcast has gone before. A Star Trek podcast told through the lens of leadership development. Subscribe today. The Starfleet Leadership Academy. Dramatis Personae, Umura. It was a rare day when an adult paid any attention to six-year-old Umura, but today was one of those days. In fact, she had been fussed over from the moment she awoke. Although it was her birthday, there was no celebration in her honor. There never had been. A young female in the Anuxon house didn't count for much. 
Umura had spent the whole morning in the chapel with its cheerful pink and orange windows of stained glass. She hadn't been alone. A priest from the temple of Ahea in central Chahal had been with her the whole time. The cleric had spent a long hour with the fingers of one hand touching his forehead and the palm of the other pressed against her breast right over the spot where she knew her heart to be. He had mumbled and murmured in an unfamiliar tongue the whole time, keeping his eyes closed and bobbing his head occasionally, almost as if he were falling asleep in his chair. Of course, he hadn't been nodding off. He had been performing a priest's miracle. When he was finished, he called to her father, who had been waiting just outside the door, into the chapel. When he entered, Umura barely recognized him. The man's face was tight and his eyes unblinking. He appeared worried. It was an emotion she had never seen on him before, but the look was short-lived, for when the priest stood up and whispered in his ear, all that tension relaxed and turned into a second unfamiliar expression. Happiness. Her father paid the priest from a purse, counting out a great number of coins before the elder man bowed and took his leave. Replacing his purse, Umura's father approached her and then actually smiled at her. That's a first, she thought warily. He sat down where the priest had sat and reached over to tousle her hair. Umura recoiled and pinched her face in mistrust. This caused her father to laugh and even smile even more broadly than before. <laughs> Umura, he began. Let me tell you a story. He removed a small golden brooch from his own tunic and pinned it to her shirt, right above her heart, right above the spot where the priest's hand had been. The brooch was in the shape of a swooping wyvern. Its eyes were tiny flecks of ruby. Once it was secured, he continued. Do you know why our house crest is the wyvern? She shook her head, wary of some kind of trap. Was he going to embarrass her as he sometimes did? Shame her for the things that she did not know or understand? Our great ancestor was once attacked by one of these fearsome creatures in the Letty Woods, just outside Chala. He was nearly killed by it, in fact. Furthermore, he was very young. The exact same age as you are right now, to be precise. You see, the tail of the wyvern is tipped with a kind of stinger. It injects a lethal poison that almost always kills the victim. By the grace of Ahia, he did not die. Somehow, he found the strength to resist the poison, and it was on that very day his arcane powers were awakened. He took the wyvern and his personal symbol and passed it to his children, who pass it to their children, and so on. Umura dared to ask a question. Father, what was that priest doing to me? He determined whether or not you have the trace of that wyvern in your bloodstream. And as we had hoped, you do. Why did you hope to find poison in my blood? Am I going to die? <laughs> Her father chuckled, almost kindly, as he shook his head. You're not going to die. Quite the opposite. You will come to life, child. It means that you have inherited the gifts that I have and that your mother and your cousins have as well. One day you will wear the tattoos, just like mine. Oh, I see. Sometimes the poison is not found? Sometimes it skips a generation. Not often, but it has happened. This is wonderful news, Amara. You'll be useful to the house after all. Congratulations. Thank you for listening to Tale of the Manticore. If you like what you've heard and would like to help support the show, there are several ways to do so. You can recommend the show online or to friends. You can like and retweet episode announcements on Twitter. You can pick up One Shot in the Dark, available for a buck fifty on Drive Through RPG. And finally, you can rate or review the show on your podcatcher of choice. My thanks to everyone who has supported the show over the last two years. I'd like to read a review from iTunes today. This one was posted by Captain Listen Pants. The captain writes, This podcast has gripped me. The presenter's voice is so rich it's like shea butter for your ears. The mix of dark fantasy storytelling and OSR role-playing really works for me. I enjoyed the mechanics of the character creation and the explanation of how things are being decided. The storytelling is gritty and enthralling. Production values are on point. Highly recommended. Well, I'm not sure about putting shea butter in your ears, but apparently Tale of the Manticore is effective on dry skin. Thank you so much for your wonderful review, Captain Listen Pants. I absolutely appreciate it. I'd also like to give a special shout-out to the Lighthouse Keeper for a very kind and heartwarming email he sent to me at the end of February. I know this acknowledgement is coming out a good while after the fact. It's the same with the reviews. That's just how it goes in the time warp of podcasting. 
that said, I am really grateful for all of the reviews and emails that I receive. Now, let's talk about this episode's great voice talent. Returning as Daz is Jared Grimm. Find Jared on Twitter at Crazy Drunken Elf. Also playing the role of Umura's father, I'd like to welcome back James, the lead GM of Tabletop Misfits on Twitch. For those of you who use socials, you can find me on Twitter at Manticore Tale, or if you prefer Instagram, I'm at Tale of the Manticore Podcast. My email is taleofthemanticore at gmail.com. I read and respond to every email I get. I also keep a blog at taleofthemanticore.blogspot.com, where I post show notes, art, character sheets, maps, and other miscellany. The story will continue on the next episode of Tale of the Manticore. The story where chaos is applied smoothly and evenly to the affected areas. Roll and Tell is an actual play podcast with two players and no game master. A podcast where the adventure isn't prepared in advance, but created as you listen. Every character. I'm going to get a quirk for them as well. <laughs> They're chronically ill. <laughs> Friends, it is I. Every danger, you see a massive skeletal salamander. What is it that you seek? Even the worlds we explore are made entirely at random. The place of the noun, I love that template. The ring of the hand, you'd never want to leave. Massive fields of grains waving in the wind and rolling hills as far as you can see. And the story itself is improvised at the roll of the dice. So join us as we roll and tell.